We're beyond excited. I am. Uh, I've been looking forward to this one for a long time. I know Josh has too. We're coming off a break too. Preston, Josh just got oh. back from a cruise, so we've been off for a week and a half. So we got some uh, pent up needs to talk macro and and other things. Sure. And um, slippers been, are on for me. I'm, I'm rocking a vodka tonic, which is oh wow uh, the drink of choice tonight. So we appreciate you. Um, how's your day been? Been fantastic. Excited to be back on again. Having been, you know, completely disconnected from civilization for seven days, I'm the most fiat of things to be on a cruise ship. It's uh, it's good to be back. Honestly, there, the, uh, enough happened in a week where it took me like three days to catch up on all the crazy shit going on. It is. But wow. There's a lot so, going on right now. Yeah. Preston, I heard that you were, so you're, you're back in the saddle flying again. You're getting your hours back. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> I am. Uh, I mean, my first flight up in a decade plus. And uh, yeah, I went out on a Cessna. It was a little bit different than flying an Apache, which was the flight before. Um, but still, just, a little. Uh, yeah, there was there was a lot of uh, missed radio calls. And <laughs> <laughs> I did. The instructor let me come in and land it. She she didn't have an issue with me coming in and landing on the on the first approach. So yeah, I did that. Wow. It was fun to be back up in the air. It was it was really good. Did it, it seem good. pretty seamless coming back to it? Just have you were you, was it pretty intuitive? Well, all of, all of my flight times rotary wing, so I don't have any fixed wing, and that's what I'm doing a fixed wing transition, getting the the rating for for fixed wing. So uh, I, mean, I kind of had the assumption that. So you yeah. don't start fixed wing no matter what you're going to fly, even helicopters. No. I was kind of assumed you did. No, nope. Uh, they start you. Yeah, it's pretty funny when you go to flight school, uh, Army flight school. Uh, the first day they take you out and you're with an instructor and they're like, all right, well, you're going to have to learn how to hover one of, uh, you know, at some point. So no better time than right now. And <laughs> you're out in this like big open field and there's probably, you know, 15 helicopters out there and you just see people spinning in circles, going sideways yeah. down the, <laughs> I feel uniquely but. qualified to talk about this. I've got about just under a hundred hours of seat time. In oh, Microsoft wow. Flight 2020. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm right there with you. You can get yeah. pretty close if you have a good if you have a good setup with a yoke and pedals yeah. and and whatnot. You can get you can learn a lot. You can save yourself a lot of money doing that for sure. Yeah. You just have no yeah. skin in the game, you know. You can yeah. crash that thing into the pyramids and it's no big deal. Yeah, but the yeah, uh, yeah the the butt feels got to be a hell of a lot different when it's your ass on the line and you're coming in with a you know a crosswind or something. Yeah, that's that is also what's very different is it's hard to kind of uh, emulate the the winds real well compared to like what it's like in real life. Like today we went out and it, I mean, it was really bumpy. That mm -hmm. was another thing that was pretty different. The Cessna 172 is really small and Tiny. yeah, I'm, I'm not used to so much turbulence just blowing me all over the place, but. Um, yeah, it was great. You know, I was I came back and my wife saw me. She saw the big grin on my face and she was like, <laughs> OK, so you had fun. I was like, yep, I had fun. <laughs> so to literally today was your first time back in a cockpit for in the last 10 years. Yeah, it was today. Well, I went out on a flight uh, with with friends here and there. But like I wasn't the pilot in command. Right. I was just kind of, you know, wiggling the sticks, but not in charge or anything. like that. What's the yeah. cadence going to be? to to get the how uh, often are you going to be in the air i'm flying about three to four times a week very cool up. wow i'll, that's I'll a need big about commitment. 30 40 hours or something like that to get the check out i'm gonna mm. go do i'm gonna go get the instrument rating right after yeah i get the fixed wing done yeah i don't know if you've been asked this before but you know i'm just gonna have to go ahead and do it in the time you've had flying or the pilots you flew with having heard all these stories from all these military pilots that see these orbs and you know, UFOs, UAPs, whatever we're calling them these days. Like, how many have you seen, Preston? How many of them? Right off the bat, we're going aliens straight off the bat, Preston. We told you we were shooting jump shots today. No, I like this. I, I, whenever I hear these stories and like you see the the imagery, like every time I've seen one of those films where like something's like moving really fast on like the IR sensor that they're that they're using to see it, like. To me, it always just looked like there was a bug that like smashed onto the uh, 
onto the 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 screen and like as they're like toggling left it's like oh my look how fast this thing's going and it's probably just like some dead bug on the yeah no i i don't i hope very it's not. very no, skepticism is the word i'm yeah. uh choosing very skeptical here. very skeptical Josh and I joke like you just want to believe. You know, you watch these Rogan <laughs> interviews. We had we uh -huh. had Matt. I don't know if you talked about. I don't think I listened to your Matt Pines convo yet. When he was on here, we talked aliens for a little while. Did you get into it with he's him? Into he's into aliens, man. He's. Uh, a, I told him. Yeah, I didn't ask him any of those questions. I saw everybody asking me online to ask him that stuff. I, because, I think he really he's really into that stuff. When we have him on again, like we're going down that rabbit hole. Sure. <laughs> I told him in the interview, I said, all these people wanted me to ask you about UFOs, but like, I just, I find it so far fetched that like, not even like remotely believable that I'm not going to ask you those questions. And he says, you should, I, I really enjoy talking. I was like, well, I have nothing for you, man. But <laughs> The problem with Pines, too, is you ask him a question like that, and it's the it, the beauty of having Matt Pines on your podcast. He will give you a 17,000-word dissertation on yeah. whatever, whatever topic you ask him. So you got to be yeah. careful. He's a, if you he he is a very casual. thoughtful person, I will tell I will yes, say that. Yes, he is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just unbelievably well-researched. I mean, not only yeah. is he hyper-intelligent, but his career, his entire vocation is dedicated to research. Mm -hmm. So you have mm -hmm. the smarts coupled with the time and energy he's putting into it yeah. and the output I mean, is crazy. Part of the reason, part of the reason that I'm starting to come to the thought that maybe I mean, these UFO things have been 20 years ago. Everyone thought it was nonsense. It seems like the Zetgeist is moving much closer to the side of like, people are taking this kind of serious at this point. And then you hear a guy like Matt Pines talk seriously about it. And you're like, all right, now there's, now I have to entertain this at least on some level. It's not just crackpots. I, <laughs> I do have one funny story. The first time I saw the Starlinks go up in like when they're kind of like in a straight line and I saw the speed that they were going through the sky, I was like, okay, so this is like in lower orbit, whatever this, is. I had no idea that that's how they were deployed. And, uh, I was standing outside my wife and my, my son was there and I was like, uh, this is really strange. Like I was like, <laughs> there is, there is something very concerning in the sky because <laughs> I could see by how fast it was going across the horizon that it was in like lower orbit. And I've yeah. never seen anything that was like a line like that. I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> but then I, I quickly Googled, like, I just saw something in the sky and this is what it looked like. And right. it was all Starlink. Yeah. Yeah. We don't get to see that up here really. I mean, down at the latitude you're at you probably see a lot more of the SpaceX activity and that stuff. We don't really. I just uh, saw it one time. I saw it one time. That was it. But yeah, it, it's pretty strange the way that they deploy those things. The the the, the reflection. If you get them at the right gotcha. angle, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Josh can of, talk about this for days. By the way, Preston, he was almost no, an no, astronaut. Here we go, man. Yeah, oh, yeah, he was almost yeah, an astronaut. Just settled for the fire service. You know, close. To uh, as you do, you know, that's just kind of a normal career path. If you flunk out of astronaut school, you end up a firefighter. It's pretty <laughs> typical. Um, do you, Preston, you probably saw that Star uh, Starship is going to fly in the next couple of weeks. Did you see that? A giant uh, I haven't nine really, meter no, rod. I, yeah, I haven't really followed it too much. It's going to be an incredible launch. The largest rocket ever ever made yeah, it's, it's fully reusable it's gonna be yeah. insane how many it, things can elon do i, I mean it's like <laughs> twitter's too one too more one too much man it's crazy it did you i mean lynn alden went full-blown offensive yeah i was against it. him i mean it, it is i don't care how gifted you are there's no possible way you can do all these things well and we we often say we wish you just focused on spacex and left the left the other stuff Tesla. Yeah, it it's it, I think I agreed with Lynn's points. I think that he he's obviously brilliant. The guy is yeah. brilliant, right? There's no if and or buts about that. Um, but he can be pretty annoying. Like, yes, at the same time, and I think that that's where people get frustrated. And you know, for you know, once you get so many haters, it's pretty easy just to double down on things that torque people. Mm. Uh, because it's, it's kind of your way to kind of rebel. And, you know, you read, uh, Elon's autobiography. There's a really, uh, I think it's Ashley Vance that wrote the, the that autobiography. That was from like 2010, it. right? It's quite yeah, a while ago. It's an old, it's an older book. It's really good, but it gets into like his childhood and how he was bullied. And I would imagine that the, the reason he acts out the way he does so often is kind of reverts back Response. to maybe some of that. Yeah. 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 I did. I read that years ago and yeah, he got the shit beat out of him a few times at school. And yeah. I think more than a few times. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think where it gets irritating is when it starts to get actually harmful. Like, I, yeah, I, I think exactly. the three of us in the in in here would agree that you know we hold Bitcoin dear enough, and the dysfunction of the financial system concerns us enough that when people just make light of shit, it's irritating, and you you know that it's tangibly harmful for a lot of folks. Yes, like when you when you post when you change the Twitter logo to a Dogecoin dog. That it that actually is going to hurt people, and mm -hmm. um, that's frustrating. And I yeah, mean, you know, we're coincidentally, in the Dogecoin top was when he was on SNL babbling about it and dressed up as Wario. That was the week that Dogecoin hit the yeah. uh, whatever, just under a dollar or whatever, and a shit ton of people piled in and lost ninety well, percent of their money at this point. It's the same point I made with Cuban, in it, which was pretty much when we had it out. Yes. Was that exact same time frame was when Elon was on uh Saturday Night Live and I was just like, listen, like you have a massive megaphone and you're choosing to pump literally a, a scheme and uh that's my issue with you. That's why I don't like you. <laughs> I think you could be doing way better things. And his big thing is well we're just having fun. We're like you can't you know, try to prevent people from having fun. And it's like, okay, well, we just, we view what this is going to do for the world very differently. And, um, and that's where, you know, that's where the disagreements happening. And I think that's where Elon, I think Elon cannot stand the sec. Right. And so Elon is putting up this dog coin logo on Twitter because it's his way of, of thumbing his nose at the sec and what's lost on Elon is people like the three of us that look at how powerful Bitcoin is and, and how much we're trying to educate the world on having people understand the power that it will wield and, and usher in this whole better life for humanity on a net basis. And uh, he's out here trying to, you know, thumb his nose at the SEC, and that's more important to him than than the other. And maybe it's because he just has, he doesn't have the time to invest. I don't know. Like, Seems I, likely, I just don't yeah. know. Yeah, I don't know. And I'm not trying to make excuses for Elon at all. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to look at why, right? Why he's acting the way he is. Yeah, I can't so, imagine he's got much time for anything, especially running the myriad of companies that he owns at this point. And there's also, I mean, with Cuban. And Elon, they've also made so much money that this kind of stuff doesn't matter to them. You know, no. it, financial stuff, as far as the money is concerned, they, you know, I don't think Elon owns any houses or yachts or anything, but he, it doesn't matter. He's got no issue with money. Neither does Cuban. Neither do most of these other billionaires besides like yeah. Bill Miller and his son seem to genuinely get it. I think you, yeah, you posted a video today. I watched that this morning. That was great. Um, but other than those guys and a few outliers, like these these people just, it doesn't matter to them. They've killed it in the fiat system. There's no reason for them to be, you know, um, posting up this Bitcoin thing when it doesn't, it doesn't benefit them in any real meaningful way. Well, yeah. the other thing too, guys, is that billionaires are used to being able to kind of bully their way into whatever, right? Any, whatever new project they enter or market they crest into, they usually have the clout and ability to, to pull the strings to move things in their favor. And here comes this Bitcoin thing that just completely inhibits this, that just doesn't give a shit. Mind you, with a community that's often very abrasive and fawns over them way less than any other community they've been a part of. And you can it can be a recipe for irritation and um, friction, for sure. You you don't have to get it. if When you have that much buying power at your disposal, it's like stored energy or however you want to like whatever tool you want to use to like understand what that means to have all that money uh, or all that currency. Um, they, they do not have to be right early. They mm. can be, they can figure it out really late in the process. I would argue even after post 50, 50 parity where Bitcoin is just as valuable as the entire fiat uh, currency system, they can be after that with how much buying power they currently have stored to their name. Mm -hmm. And they're still like absurdly rich if they start to migrate at that point. Right. And, and so that's lost on a lot of people that are seeing it just drastically change their lives. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, they just don't have to, they don't have to be as right as 
most other people need to be. <laughs> Such a good to. point. And you just yeah. alluded to it. The inverse is true for people that are strapped. You know, we yeah. talk about that this that on the show a lot, Preston, is that like, you know, I'm hesitant to say this because, yeah, I think that into perpetuity, Bitcoin will be a great haven to preserve buying power. But in terms of life changing, family changing, yeah. generational wealth procuring opportunity, that ship will sail for a firefighter that's got ten thousand dollars of free cash flow a year to put yeah. into Bitcoin in who knows what that time frame is, but life changing opportunity will eventually set sail and crest over the horizon. You're just the opposite of someone that's a billionaire that can hang out and wait until they see the, the whites in the eyes and yep. to, until they fire the arrow. So yeah. Exactly okay, right. In terms of uh, transitioning here, before we constrain you with specific questions, I want to start <laughs> generic and ask you, what's on your mind right now? Preston, what have you been researching? What charts have you been looking at last couple of days? Start us off wherever your passions are currently directed. Uh, I guess for me, I, uh, let's start with the Bitcoin uh, chart uh, in dollar terms. You know, it's it's doing great. It's uh, crushing it this year. Last year was obviously very brutal in dollar terms. Um, I think most people should have been expecting that. Uh, you know where we were at. If you if you buy into the four year cycle, I think that there's some validity there. I think that watching the central banks tighten the the M two money supply aggressively was uh, probably a bigger indicator for me to probably stay in cash. You know, like if I was going back and analyzing those moments in time. Um. Yeah. So you know, I, I think those are the big things for me personally. It's either you own dollars if you think it's going to do aggressively well because they're tightening the, the amount of monetary units in the system where you own Bitcoin. It's, it's just that simple. It's not, yep. it's not too hard. Uh, most of this comes down to like, when you understand how market caps work for equity, uh, anything that's equity based, uh, if you're, if you're valuing that with this old dying currency, like you're just going to get ridiculous uh, market premiums in, in those market caps. And so that's why I just can't really touch those unless they get, grossly compressed, um, then, you know, like I would have to analyze what that is. And, you know, the, the company would have to be kind of like a micro strategy for me to even entertain it at this point. Um, but, uh, outside of the Bitcoin price, I, I expect it to continue to do well this year. I think it's going to aggressively outperform everything, uh, in the legacy, uh, markets. It's done that, uh, I don't know what it's up this year, but like 70, 80% this year, I think the S&P and every, yeah, everything else is like maybe 10%. So I, I see that uh, outsized performance to continue to persist through the end of the year. Um, when I'm looking at other things, that, the thing that's really kind of captured my attention is really the credit markets and just watching the the treasury market versus the European credit markets, whether that's the pound or the euro or, or whatever, um, they don't have any of it under control over there. None of it. And this is where I get a little frustrated with commentators that are U.S. centric and they're just looking mm. at the U.S. treasury uh, inverted yield curve and they're seeing it kind of go sideways. It's actually like expanding where like the short end of the curve or the short duration stuff is like still selling off, but the longer duration stuff is, is getting a bid and you're like seeing it explode out. But I would say on a net across all durations, it's going sideways and they're looking at that and they're saying, all right, it's in, uh, this market's going to turn like this whole treasury, uh, bond yield curve is going to get bid from this point forward. We're going into a recession and I think we, we can still be going into a recession, but I don't necessarily know that the treasury yield curve is done selling off. We'll, we'll find out. Um, but when I look at the, the global macro and how it's all together, when I look at the yield curves over in Europe, they're not demonstrating anything sideways. They're demonstrating a, a disgusting sell off continuing and they have none of the energy under control. They have none of the um, just prices in general, supply chains, like all of that. Like, I just don't, I don't see any change. And I guess I'm just looking at it from a price action standpoint, right? 
the price action has not demonstrated to me that there has been any change in the in the standard volatility that has happened throughout the sell-off. So until I see something that demonstrates that that volatility has changed and it's started to go in, in the opposite direction, like as far as I'm concerned, we're still in a sell-off, like an aggressive sell-off over in Europe. And since these markets are completely intertwined with the U.S., um, I guess I'm just looking at it and saying, well, I, I, I don't buy it. I don't, I don't think that the pain train is done in treasuries until we get some type of price action that clearly demonstrates that there's a, sh there's a, been a shift in that volatility, uh, to a bid. I I'm just not seeing it. So maybe, it, maybe it's happened, you know, uh, but I'm not seeing it. That's for sure. So, uh, so we're, what does that mean? So, uh, oil, right? So we're looking at oil. It's looking like it may start to level out and may start to bid, especially as we're talking about OPEC cuts. How much of that do you think is bark versus actual bite? I don't know. OPEC is, has, has made statements similar, you know, as long as 20 years ago and it kind of stayed status quo. Do you think that this time might be different as far as OPEC is concerned, like with trading in yuan or or some other currency. I, I like to look at it like if I'm if I'm wearing their hat and you would literally put me over there and said, "Hey, crush crush uh, Western economies." I'm like, okay, uh, I'm just going to absolutely suffocate supply out of the market. It's going to be painful for us in the short term. You know, we're not going to make nearly as much money. But if you really want me to bring the pain train to them and and literally melt down their currencies. This is how I would do it. I would just, I would suck all the supply out of the market. China's coming back online. There's a little bit of a lag there. Uh, we're going to, we're going to juice the price of oil back over a hundred, hundred and twenty dollars per barrel. And it is going to melt down their credit markets. Like that would be my play if you put <laughs> me in the seat over there to, to do that. Um, so when, when people are like, well, this is pretty standard. They're doing, what was it, like a million a day in, in the cut? I would, I would say, well, uh, that's what they're telling you. Um, maybe they're doing a million and a half or two million a day in, in reality. Um, and they're going to have you eat it. Yeah. So I'd, here's, the, here's the thing. I have no idea what the reality <laughs> of that's going to be. But I do know from a strategy standpoint, like putting on like a strategy hat, that's how I would play it if I was them. If I if I really wanted to bring uh, Western economies to their knees, that's how I would do it. Yeah. One of the most exciting companies and projects that Josh and myself, Dan, have come across in the last few years is CrowdHealth. If you're already familiar with CrowdHealth and have interest in checking it out, then use code BLUE for a significant three-month trial discount. Healthcare is an incredibly confusing, stressful, and cumbersome space to navigate. CrowdHealth provides a remarkable and workable alternative to traditional healthcare setups for a fraction of typical premiums. It's essentially the decentralization of healthcare. You can leverage the power of Bitcoin alongside healthcare crowdfunding to put decisions about your health back in your hands. Each member gets access to great healthcare services as well as their own dedicated care advocate that will negotiate your bills and find members the best doctors and hospitals. Go to joincrowdhealth.com to learn more. And if you're interested in the Bitcoin specific crowdfund, go to joincrowdhealth.com slash Bitcoin. BCB listeners can enjoy healthcare freedom with code BLUE to get your first three months for a substantial discount at $99 a month. That is code BLUE. CrowdHealth is not health insurance, which we feel is a wonderful thing. If you have health care needs or concerns, seriously, give CrowdHealth a look. The Blue Collar Bitcoin Podcast is brought to you by arguably the most legendary company in Bitcoin, CoinKite. They are the producers of the renowned Cold Card, the world's most trusted and secure Bitcoin signing device, built with a plethora of features fit for Bitcoin beginners all the way up to the most advanced of users. This device is a one-stop shop for your Bitcoin custody needs, and something the two of us have trusted for years. CoinKite also manufactures the Block Lock, a gorgeous e-ink digital display art piece sitting in the background of what seems to be every serious Bitcoiner on the planet. Block Lock can be programmed to scroll through key Bitcoin metrics including price, hash rate, next having date, and much more. Boy oh boy will this thing look good in your living room or office. They are also the makers of many other security and fun products for all users, no matter their technical aptitude. 
Support our show and get a delicious discount on CoinKite products by following our affiliate link on the screen and in the notes and using code BCB for 5% off the cold card. I would do it. Yeah. Um, and for any type of landing to be even remotely construed as smooth, they have to have inflation under control and they really yes. they need recession. And so this is where this is what you got me thinking about when you were on Swan Signal. Like and we talked about this with Joe Consorti uh before Josh left on his trip. Like the fly in the ointment is inflation. Like if you're sitting around wondering no like even just about this banking crisis, like how could this happen? How could these capital losses have occurred? It's like stop. They shut the economy down for 2 years. They printed a ton of money and a lot of that is unwinding right now and in order for that to in in any it's, way shape or form spin move out of it they have to get inflation under control so the thought here what you're alluding to is like if they don't and if the if these say oil dynamics cause you know cpi to rip again or or whatever look out man i mean it could get really really chaotic and really really weird quickly i'm assuming you agree so it's everything you said but it's even more pronounced than that because it's all these actions after covid but it was all super saturated for 40 years as they were uh, manipulating uh interest rates and the cost of capital to consolidate enterprise for literally 40 years straight and so now you have this extremely fragile economy, Western economy, and then you do everything that you just described, which is why they can't get it under control, right? If you had truly a free and open market and a free and open cost of capital and you had all the like actual uh, uh, creative destruction happening in the economy leading up to COVID. And then you do this one time, like money bonanza, like they did, it's going to be able to, to remedy itself in a constructive and much more effective and efficient kind of way. But you did it after you, after you took the 80 year old frail patient that's been in a wheelchair for, for two decades, and then you force them to stand up and run a hundred meter marathon. Yeah. Right? That's what they did. And so that's, that's where it makes us so different. And this is, so when we're looking at Europe and we're looking at rates and you're right, it all comes down to inflation. And here's why inflation is the keystone to economic calculation period. Like you cannot perform economic calculation on anything until you know how much debasement is happening on the currency. Okay. If you tell me that the debasement on the currency is 2%, I know in credit markets that I've got it out, that I have to have something as a premium above that 2%. Then the equity has to have a premium above that credit, which is higher risk, right? All of your risk calculations start with inflation. Mm. And so when we're looking at what is inflation, and this is why, I mean, it was a dang meme. I, I would say it for a year straight with hashtag, how do you measure inflation? How do you measure... And, and where I was getting at with this is when you're looking at the M2, and this is going before COVID, they were, they kept adjusting this, these rates and they kept putting M2 and they kept doing QE and they were doing all this. And what they were doing is they were destroying middle class America. They were destroying middle, mid cap enterprise and they were consolidating it into large cap enterprise and ex extremely wealthy individuals. And when you do that, you don't have this homogeneous type setup in society. Um, that's what makes it so fragile. That's yeah. the fragility. I, th this can't be said enough. You say it all the time on your show. We say it all the time on this show. But I think it's still sinking in for me year over year just how systemically fragile this economic organism is. Like an analogy that I I started a tweet draft for, or it was something to the effect of like, if you are on a hike and you only are ever allowed to go uphill, right? You're on a 15 mile hike and the grade yeah. can only go upward and you can never go downward. Well, you ultimately end up in very thin air. You gradually end up at the top of Mount Everest. You don't have enough oxygen. That happens slowly. And so 
you're physiologically strained, right? Maneuvers to survive and adapt and overcome escape you because you've never been able to go down grade. Mm-hmm. And you zoomed out on a 40 year time frame. That's essentially what we're looking at. We're looking at an economic organism that's never been allowed to go downhill and yeah. now can barely breathe. And everything is just having to get way more complex to keep it alive. You know, I think about like as paramedics, when we run a cardiac arrest, if someone's pulseless and not breathing, the the measures that we implement to keep them alive get very complex. They need tons of medications, epinephrine, amiodarone. They need to be intubated. They All these different things, are, five medics are doing all these different things, and it gets increasingly more complex. And as time goes on, the likelihood that the, the person's going to be resuscitated goes down. And that's kind of where we're at. Like, they're having to introduce new medications, like... One one of the things we want to get into is all these these new uh, tactics that literally originate overnight, and we'll talk about yeah. the bank term funding program and stuff like that. But back to the main point that you had hinted at that I think people need to be aware of: it, it things are so fragile, and I guess in addition to that, the more fragile something becomes, the less predictable it is in a lot of ways. And that's yeah. back to just the confusion that the that you feel that we feel of like trying to predict what happens next is far more complicated in 2023 than it was in 2003 or probably 1983 because this thing increasingly is on its deathbed. Yeah, I think you could almost make the counterpoint to what you said as well, Dan. It's kind of amazing to me that this patient is still alive at all. This is like the your your 90 year old relative that's on, uh, you know, a respirator that just you're like, oh, it's going to be any minute and they last Six months, eight months, two years later, they're still around, and you're like, I don't even understand how this is possible. But this this 80 year old patient is still making it for this prolonged period of time when just one thing after another hits it. Um, Preston, uh, one thing about the CPI that I think is interesting, and I know you know this, but it's good to reiterate this to the audience. And because CPI is such an in- such an important metric for the economy. It's been manipulated over and over throughout the years. In the 80s, they changed the basket of goods, or they um, basically change the um, specific thing. Like if it was steak that gets measured, now it's beef. If it was chicken, now it's chicken thighs instead of chicken breast. Those types of measures and changes, they can use to manipulate what the official CPI is so that the economy or the people that are measuring this kind of stuff can actually uh, don't freak out to the degree that they probably are warranted to because the official CPI has basically been bullshit for 50 years. Um, I heard, I don't know if this is true or not. I heard rumor that they were going to change some other parameters of it just recently. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah, there was something that was published at the start of 2023 of how they were going to recalculate CPI yet again. Surprisingly, Um, right? Yeah. Yeah. I can't get into the, I don't, I don't know the specifics, but I, I remember Luke Roman was thinking that it could, that it could take oil out of it or something. Uh, no, it was the, the recalculation was going to be like in excess of a hundred basis points, uh, difference, which then, so what you're really doing is you're trying to reprice credit markets because they're just going to look at the new number and say, Oh, it's, it's down. Let's go ahead it's, and bid bonds. Right. The thing that's hard to believe is that the people that are in these markets, the the professionals, they're not stupid. Like, oh, no, are they yeah. really taking this stuff at face value? Like who's believing these numbers? I mean, these guys know the history. They know what's going on. At least think they do. Who's bl- yeah. who's buying this? I think they. I think they're just looking at the numbers, and I think that they are. Uh, it's not their money, you yeah, know. For that's the true. Most part, it's just some pension plans. That's that a good need point. To have um, some type of being on the pension board. I've heard these guys yeah. say. Multi- I've had this conversation with them. Like, this is CPI. How do you get? Do you guys believe this number? And they'll give you their rationale for why this is reasonable. But it's like look across the table at them. Like, I know they're full of shit. They know they're full of shit. They know I know yeah. they're full of shit. And yet we're all having this conversation pretending everything's fine here. They don't want to be viewed as doing something that is risky. Right. Yeah. Right. They would much rather have something that's a non-risky position, be dead wrong about it, but not be judged for having what was right. considered the low risk investment, which was they're bonds, safely in the herd. Right? Their, yeah. Because everybody collectively got their face ripped off together but they were in the the least riskiest thing, so they weren't. They were being prudent, right, with er- everyone else's money. That's the game. They're, they're they're just truly trying to, and and they they can still suck whatever fee they want out of said huge number, um, 
and they can continue to to suck that fee out because you haven't been fired for for lack of prudence. That's that's the name of the game. That makes total they, sense. They also don't see the escape hatch. Like I think <laughs> no. I think when you're in Bitcoin, the amount that the three of us are, you lose sight of how even it's been a remarkable 14 years, but this thing is still very small, very poorly understood, hard to understand in a lot of mm-hmm. regards. And so mm-hmm. You have a bunch of people in a large smoke-filled building just trying to get to the area where it's easiest to breathe, not realizing that there is an exit illuminated. Yeah. And so that that's where I think it's like we would agree that in, in the TradFi world, there is no great place to be. I mean, pick equities, oh, no, fixed income, cash. There's no great place to be. No. We, we think we've found the answer, but most people haven't, and understandably so. So it's like, why are they owning this? Because in their view, there's no other escape. There's no other option. This is the environment they're in, and it can't be changed. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. I think once you get to a price, and I was saying this back in 2020 interviews, I think once you get to a price that's in excess of 100000 I think there's something that psychologically happens mm. uh, with just how legacy finance starts to view it. It's been around for more than a decade. It's in excess of $100,000. It's It's like gold is what they're going to say. And we think everybody should have one or 2% of it in their portfolio uh, to, you know, to help protect you yourself against uh, fiat debasement is really going to be, I think the the shift, but as long as it's kind of like under that level, for whatever reason, I think that you're just going to continue to have it viewed optically as, as um, you know, that's what these crazy people are, are holding on to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. As while we're on the topic of just weak things or what, kind of the sick animals in the herd in the economy, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on commercial real estate. We had a little discussion with Joe Consorti about this, mm-hmm. and there's some interesting parallels in commercial real estate uh, to residential real estate in 2008. Interest rates have changed. They have you know these five-year balloon loans that they have to refi, and it's looking very unlikely they're going to be able to refi and still be profitable. Mm-hmm. So there's that. There's, I mean, there's there's no one buying these things right now, especially mm-hmm. a lot of these, you know, mall like commercial properties. Like nobody wants that. It's it's total, you know, garbage. Um, there's low demand, obviously. Um, so their their most likely option is default, unless they get bailed out, which is always a possibility. And the other thing that's really interesting about this is that it's mostly regional banks, like small regional banks, that own yeah. the loans for these things. So as that all gets flushed. Um, do you see that as like, like a prominent risk in the near future or you think oh, that's, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that that's probably the top of the list R- risk that you just can't make go away when you're dealing with rates that they need in order to taint what, what they think is going to be taming inflation, inflation, um, and it, it goes down to just like basic bond valuations. Like if you understand how bond math works, you can quickly understand how equity math works and how real estate right. math works. Um, when you go from an environment where you shoveled a bunch of, of printing into the hands of, of the world to the tune of trillions of dollars and interest rates were nothing. And then all of a sudden interest rates start or uh, inflation starts manifesting itself. And those rates have to, chase out they have to sell off to a level that's higher than those than that inflation uh cap rates on on um real estate they have to move with it just like just like a bond sell off right and so when you look at that impairment and when you look at the capex to sustain property yes it's crazy and those numbers don't jive like they do when you're when you're dealing with nothing percent interest rates on the capex sustainment and depreciation costs and all that. If you're actually factoring it in and you know uh, doing correct valuations, because depreciation is a real expense to the business, um, regardless of how much they want to tell you to use EBITDA numbers. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be a travesty. The turnover, you're already seeing it in, in just the fact that how many people can afford to move out of their house that locked in rates at nothing percent and go move into a new house at these higher rates. And, and I'm still, going nowhere, I'll tell you that and, much. And Same still here. have the cost of living that they had before. So you see, you, 
you don't see people selling, you don't see people buying. So you're, you, I think that's causing a lot of it to maybe slow down is just the, the velocity, the turnover right. isn't there. Like it was back when the rates were continuing to always go down, you had a lot of velocity through it. And so now you don't nearly have as much as, as it's going up, but it will realize it, it will express itself at some point. It's just a matter of when. But yeah, I think that's going to be, when you look at the sheer size of that market, it is so massive. It is so upside down. It's so impaired. Um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be monstrous. How do you see that? So if you're, if you're Jerome Powell and you're presiding over this commercial property shit show blowing up on you, what do you think are the likely steps they would try to take to head that off? Do you think they will just bail out these regional banks and kind of call it a day? Or do you think they would make it go further to bail out some of these, some of these companies owning these properties and stuff? I it seems unlikely they would, but do you think that do you think those banks would get bailed out? I guess is the primary question. How would they handle that? Is it's there another depend, avenue? Yeah, it's going to depend how uh, whether it's like a waterfall, like it all comes crashing down at the same time, or if it's kind of like more uh, spread out over time. If it's more spread out, they're going to let them fail, and then the bigger banks are going to gobble up all the all of that. And, uh, and then the bigger banks are going to get the bailout. Um, if it happens all at once, then they may have to do some type of blanket, uh, bailout for all of them together. I actually think that the, they would actually prefer for the smaller ones to go bankrupt than for all of that to get consolidated up, at, up at the mm. higher level is what I would, I would think that that's what they would actually prefer. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know how that's going to actually play out. If I, if I was a betting person, that's how I would, well, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not quite sure how, uh, how I'd go either way. Well, and the, the other thing we said last week, Preston was like, the further, the further you get away from the epicenter, the harder this stuff is to control. So like re yeah. reliquifying the banking sector is one thing, negotiating, you know, the unwind of commercial real estate is another. And it just seems glaringly obvious that all roads eventually lead to the balance sheet going through the freaking roof. Oh, no doubt. I mean, and this is where you get to numbers. Like if people are sitting around wondering like, how, how does the balance sheet go that high? How does it go through yeah. the moon? Well, first of all, obviously rewind over the last few years, but they're going to have to do what they're going to have to do. Everything is so dirty and so interconnected that, there's, they're gonna, they're not gonna have much of a choice. These, these decisions are gonna be thrust upon them in short order. Yeah. And if any one of us were making the decisions, we'd probably do the exact same thing, given the choice between full blown system unwind and keeping the keeping the band plan. Yeah, they have to. They have to make sure there's liquidity in the system. When you're dealing with a fractional reserve, they have scheme, to. They yeah. have to keep the liquidity in the system, or they will literally have social unrest and riots on the street. And they they know that they clearly know that that's the outcome of them not having enough liquidity in the system. So they're going to make sure there's liquidity in the system. They're going to try their best to to do it surgically, but I think eventually it's going to get away from them and they're going to have to do blanket type policies like we saw in 2020. The, the policies this time around are going to be way in excess of what you saw in 2020. And that's probably surprising for a lot of people because they're they're saying, oh, well, this COVID was unprecedented and COVID. Was, right. And they're about to have their bell rung on the sheer size of printing and debasement that's going to pop out of the next thing. Whether there's a uh, pandemic war crisis, like you can put those aside and not even have those play out. And they're still going to have to have debasement far in excess of what happened during COVID. The Bitcoin conference is coming this May in Miami, and you do not want to miss out. Dan and I will be there. This three-day event is the ultimate destination for anyone looking to stay ahead of the curve and work in the industry. Industry day tickets are available for those who want to network with like-minded professionals and learn from the top experts in the field. For those who want the ultimate VIP experience, the Whale Pass is the way to go. With exclusive access to private events and top-level speakers, you'll get the inside scoop on the latest trends and insights in the industry. So why wait? Get your tickets now and join us at the Bitcoin Conference in Miami, where the future of finance is being shaped today. Use code BCB23 to get 10% off tickets, and we will see you in Miami. 
And it's and because they, it, they admit it, dude. Like well, I was reading, you you've built a fire. Sorry to interrupt you. They've built a fire that's so big, okay, that the area right to feed that fire, like it has to be, uh, it has to be a whole lot of energy dropped into that fire to to sustain it because of the the sheer size of how big it is. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dan. Oh no, I was just gonna say, like, look no further than just what they're saying. I was reading um, Lavish's piece on Treasury and the CBO's statements. I mean, even with completely clear skies ahead, with no expectation of recession, just to pull one metric here, the Congressional Budget Office is projecting 200% debt over GDP by like early 2050s. Like, Mm -hmm. even they are admitting we're in a we're in a crisis of sorts and they're yeah. they're showing charts going parabolic yeah with the most optimistic of bent trying to smooth things over as much as possible it is truly amazing to me when people that are at least i feel have what it takes to understand these dynamics just it's still not clicking that this is a crisis this is a math problem out of which there aren't many options for escape um, uh, none I of think, which don't lead to significant debasement, you know? I think your common person would, would look at it like this. This is how they would describe it. Well, they did this back in 2008, Dan. Like, they've been doing this forever. Yeah. And then that's the end of their analysis. They're done. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And I think it's, it. it's it's almost always, it's, it's not within any of our lifetimes. It's not within our parents' lifetime. Yeah. It's, you know, it's because maybe, you can call it within Josh, our they, grandparents. Lifetime, they would say maybe. because it hasn't happened in our lifetime. Exactly. Right. Like that's like it's a um, flawed logic, right? It's never happened in our lifetime. So recency it bias, right? I think yeah, that's what it is. Bias. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I, I mean, World War II hasn't happened in my lifetime. So shit like that never happens. Yeah, this yeah, doesn't exactly. happen. It's never happened. <laughs> right. <laughs> so let's intense. let's talk about these new facilities and tactics. I yeah. you said you you basically size them up as a form of yield curve control. Mm -hmm. Um, unpack that for our audience, explain what you mean by that and and go wherever you want there. So I sent over to you guys a calculator, pull it up here, here. a bond calculator for, if anybody wants to tinker with this, I would highly encourage people to tinker with this because it'll help you understand how bond, how the price of a bond changes with interest rates. And when you're hearing us talk about all this fancy bond stuff, like it's just going to make perfect sense for you if you play around with, there's what four input fields and then a calculate button it's yeah. super simple we'll link this in the notes um, preston if people want perfect. to mess around perfect. and i think yeah. for a lot of people this is such counterintuitive like most of this especially with bonds it's all very counterintuitive for people that are in the equity world and think about that um so it this is going to make your life a lot easier to try to understand these things yeah well let's so when I say that uh for the last 40 years right when I when I say that phrase Bonds have just gone up in value, and you could have been a ham, ham sandwich and been a bond trader and made a ton of money. Um, let me demonstrate to you why, okay? So if we go back prior to 2008, I think interest rates back then were like 5 6%. Um, let's go ahead and just put that in. So your coupon would be on $1,000. Go ahead for par value, type in 1000 so this would be a thousand dollar bond. Your coupon for that, let's just say it's six uh, percent. So you'd put in sixty, sixty dollars a year, okay. Um, and then your years to maturity. Let's go ahead and use a ten year uh, years to maturity, and then new interest rate. So what I want to demonstrate is everybody knows interest rates went down for forty years from nineteen eighty till basically twenty twenty, right? So let's take. Uh, the new interest rate, let's say it's gone down and it's down to 5%. So put in a five there, just type five. Okay. Then hit calculate. And what you can see is your thousand dollar bond has gone up in value because interest rates dropped the 5%, right? And now that bond is worth a thousand seventy seven. Okay. Now what I want, I also want to demonstrate to you when we say the, uh, the duration, if it's long duration, it's actually impacted more by interest rates. So go into the years to maturity and change that to a 30 year bond. Okay. And then look what happens to the price. So a 10 year was, was repriced to 1077. This is now 1153 because you got more years to accumulate that 6% interest rate that you, that you have on your bond versus the 5% that everybody else in the market's getting. Okay. Now this is where it gets really interesting. Go ahead and change your duration back to 10. Okay. And, 
uh, let's do something dramatic. Let's say we went from the 2008 crisis. Okay. What did they do to interest rates after the 2008 crisis? Drop them to nothing. Bernanke dropped them to nothing. Yellen dropped them to nothing. So let's go ahead and drop it down to like 1%. Okay. So new interest rate dropped to 1% and hit calculate. And look what happened to the bond price. Okay. So you're up by them just dropping those rates. You're up 47% on that bond going from a six, what used to be a 6% yielding bond to 1%. Okay. Now here's where, so, so when people are thinking about the legacy system and why it just worked so well for everybody around the world, because remember everybody was stacking treasuries for 40 years straight, everybody on the planet. They were getting paid in treasuries. They saved in treasuries. And as far as, as anybody was concerned, their buying power just always went up because we went from 16% interest rates to 1% interest rates on a, on a 10-year duration bond. So as they're continuing to buy these things and storing their buying power for all the labor that they were performing, they're sending oil, they're sending all these natural resources, and then they're getting paid in dollars, and then they're, they're locking them into treasuries long duration treasuries, they're killing it for 40 years. Now, all of a sudden that's, you have deflection in the bedrock of, of the entire global economy. And you've built this massive city on top of that, that bedrock, which is treasuries. Okay. So go back to your calculator, pull that back up. And what I want you to do is at the top where it says coupon, we can put in, I think the 10 year got down to like 50 basis points, right? Which would have been five for your coupon, $5 on a thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, years to maturity, keep it around 10 because on an average, you're probably around like six or seven years, but we'll just use 10 years to kind of demonstrate the, the point here on the new interest rate. Where are we at right now on the 10 year? Hold on. I'll look it up. 10 year is at 3.4. The three month, which I th find really interesting, is at 5%, right? Let's go ahead and just put in 5% for your new interest rate, just to kind of demonstrate how dramatic this is. So go ahead and hit calculate. And you can see wow, that, that, quite bond, a drop. that bond is worth $652. That $1,000 bond that you bought during the 2020 COVID crazy, right, is now worth 652 This is what happened to all the banks. So like... On their balance sheet, they're sitting on all these treasuries. They were given a gob of money during COVID. They have to go out there. They have to buy these bonds that were yielding literally nothing. Um, they loaded up on them. I had, I had conversations online with people during the 2020 timeframe. And I said, you're getting 50 bips on a 10 year bond and you're out here buying it like a total idiot picking up pennies in front of the steamroller the herd again and, right and i had i had wall streeters like mansplaining like how like well if it goes negative we can make even more money right if the if the interest rates can even go lower it it'll be even more money we'll make and i'm thinking uh <laughs> you're just an idiot right dangerous once case. again not not seeing any escape though too like in there to fit like where I mean I guess yeah there's things you can hedge into into harder assets but like you have to own short duration so you go back to the calculator right if you have short duration so like put in one year on that right uh and see how much the price changes like yep. it's it's preserving totally you're not losing the principal on it right so this is what this is what this new and, and this is why I want you guys to pull this up. So they they come out with this facility, right? Everybody's upside down. None of these banks have positive equity. If they have to mark to market all of their treasuries, they're all negative equity for every one of these banks right. because of this dynamic that's playing out. Um, now there's there's some that went out and and hedged the risk, the interest rate risk. They're probably not upside down, but I think if you went and and if you really truly made them mark to market all their books. It's a bloodbath, yeah. total bloodbath. I'm curious if you, um, why would they buy 10 years? So if you're, if you know, you're not really sure which way this thing's going to go, at least if you bought yeah. like the three month or six month or something, some short duration, 
Yeah. The worst that can happen is you just have to hold it for that three month period. You get your money back. Correct. To go. Yeah. So why are they, why are they reaching out for 10 years in this low interest rate environment? Get locking this in for, I mean, this makes no everybody sense. was convinced that, that the fed couldn't produce inflation. If you go back prior to like 2020, right. everybody was like, I don't think that they can, I don't think they can produce inflation for some strange reason. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe everybody... maybe massive globalization and tons of deflationary forces coming at, into a head, you know. And but I think I, your MMT after 2008, everybody that... was expecting that inflation. I remember paying attention to this stuff. I bought gold and thinking like this is going to moon because inflation is going to get crazy after they printed all that money. But what I think a lot of these more simple minded investors didn't understand, including myself, was that this wasn't getting stuffed right into the regular economy. This was totally. all going to the banks. And I, I mean, honestly, didn't well, really understand everybody... this totally till recently. And it's and there's that misunderstanding of the difference between COVID stimulus, which is like helicopter money, which is inflationary, and then the QE, which is not necessarily inflationary, except for everybody you know, was assets. biased. Josh, everybody was biased from the previous event, right. the 2008 event. Again, the recency is, bias. They came in, they did all this QE, and it was actually like inflation dropped. It didn't go up. And so everybody was looking at this and like, they're not going to be able to produce so. Here it is. And uh, anyway, so when you do that bond math, you figure it out. So now what this facility is, this uh, bank, what's the BTF? Bank term funding program. Thank you. It's so almost what's this, by the dip. So yeah, what this is, is going back to your bond calculator, they're, they're marking it, so, or they're, they're lending them the full par value, even though it might be worth $650 or, or $700 on the thousand. Right, they're giving the bank the full thousand, and they're making them pay the the five percent interest rate. Okay, so mm -hmm. it's it's basically like uh, if you go in there and you and you shift around the the new interest rate, or you shift around the par value and mark it up to thirteen hundred dollars, right? Then you can get the math to come out to what that bank is effectively paying to have that liquidity, right? So if if you're adjusting the par value up in order to produce that that result, that's yield curve control. Yeah. You're stepping in and you're you're adjusting prices in order to produce a yield that it does not exceed. Mm. Okay. So it's like a targeted yield curve yield yeah. curve control apparently. Uh, yeah. Now what now what a a person who you know, if you had a Wall Streeter here, they'd be like that's not what's happening because it's only for a year and, um, you know, they have to pay that back. Right. But in the meantime, what the, what the central banks are trying to do is they're trying to create a massive recession so that inflation drops and then the bonds go back to their value. So it's almost like they put their hand in the cookie jar. They stole a cookie, but then they went out to the store and they were able to find the same cookie to put back in the jars. What they're, yes, is, is what the scheme is. Right. But as we all know, when you manipulate things and you play, when when you lie and you manipulate, you might just get caught with your with your hand in the cookie jar, and you might yeah. just and, and everybody in the world might come to realize there was never a cookie in there for an entire year, um, and it was just one giant manipulated lie. And 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 uh, back to it, the cost of capital, right? Going back to the valuation of everything. When you're manipulating the cost of capital, the prices of everything, everything's getting misconstrued. It's it's almost like if if we had to tap into our brain and, and look at the at the queuing, the the chemicals that are providing queuing for us to make informed, intelligent decisions, and you're manipulating that. Well, you're not gonna that person's not gonna be able to walk appropriately. That person's not gonna be able to eat food at the right time. That person's not gonna be, and that's what's happening to the global economy. We are screwing with the chemical balance that should naturally occur between entities to conduct energy exchange, right? Whether it's between you and me, a company to company, a country to country, all of those, all of that signaling is being mutilated in real time. And this is why you have, uh, this is why you have all the BRICS nations, which just happen to be net producers are saying we are not accepting that lie of a digital unit anymore. There's too much deflection in it. 
We know that it's going to require way more printing, which is only going to deflect it worse. What we used to be able to store our value in, that appreciated in value because of the bond math, is no longer in existence anymore. And we know that, that the gig is up. Right. And we know that you're going to lie to us from here forward. And that's and why we're not going to play this game anymore. We've already displayed to the world that at any time we can just simply freeze those accounts, which they thought they had Only sovereign access to. Yeah, makes it. I mean, that just multiplies the the herd mentality to run away from this when it's not only getting debased, but it's also censored. And you know, the sanctionability that we wield over every other country in the world is a harbinger over their head and their economy. And it's no wonder that they want to escape that cage. That the you know the door is kind of swinging open and they're running out. Did you guys see the Loki uh, show on Disney? The Have not. Uh, no, with the Marvel show. Well, he had like this, he had this stick that uh, the Owen Wilson character, he could like go up and like, he could like poke the person with the stick and they would literally like evaporate. He'd like just vaporize them. That's what, that's what the U S effectively did when they seized the, yeah. the, the reserves. They, they basically took this Mobius, you know, Loki stick and they literally vaporized the retained earnings of an entire nation. And so, like, anybody standing around watching somebody get vaporized, like, like, what message are you sending to the totally. world when you vaporize somebody, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Who's going to trust the person with the vaporization stick? It, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. You, you can say whatever you want. You can, you know, ethics aside of... OPEC nations and Russia and whatever, the incentives are so obvious that they want out of this current game and nobody can blame them. And then you start to say, okay, so what fits in a less trust filled global environment where trust is breaking down? What assets are going to allow our species to continue to coordinate? And especially with the world moving increasingly digital, uh, that list narrows very, very uh, prominently down to, to one thing in our mind. Obviously, there's more things that can work. You can stack gold, and you're seeing these other dynamics. But, yeah, you're going to see, I think the next couple of decades, you're going to see a lot of, of treasury divestment, and the game is changing. And tactics like that, I think, can be argued are, are extremely short-sighted when you think about what incentives they imbue. Yep. The crazy thing, and just to summarize this this conversation about just like BTFP in particular, the temporary nature of a program like this is totally predicated, once again, on rates coming back down and inflation getting under control. This is anything but temporary if it goes in the other direction. And when you have these net producers like OPEC calling the bluff, yeah, and if, if inflation doesn't come back down and rates don't come back down, I'll say what I said earlier, things could get extremely chaotic because it feels like what 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 feels like has been mitigated is totally predicated on that move and that assumption that everything's coming down and I don't think we no can doubt. stress that enough. Amen. Like you couldn't have said it any better, Dan. Dan and myself Josh talk a lot on this show about running a Bitcoin node. If you are a serious Bitcoiner and you want to verify, not trust, you will take this step at some point. For our node setups, we run software and hardware from Start9 Labs. This setup enables us to run a reliable and secure Bitcoin node, but then if we so choose, experiment and graduate way beyond that towards many different areas of sovereign computing. You can download Embassy OS for free and install it on your own hardware, or you can buy one of Start9's plug and play devices. We highly recommend these devices. Start9 builds reliable and extremely easy to use products backed up with incredible customer support. Run a Bitcoin node run a lightning node, run a Noster relay, take control of your photos, messages, passwords, pictures, and data, all on one device. Embassy OS operating system is the distribution platform open source software has been waiting for. Visit start9.com. We only recommend and endorse companies that we believe in, and Swan Bitcoin is a company we believe in. I have been personally using Swan to DCA into Bitcoin since May of 2020 when Bitcoin was the Wii price of $9,500. Swan's interface and on-ramp is incredibly simple and user-friendly. With Swan, you can dollar cost average daily, weekly, or monthly, or conduct a smash instant buy whenever you want. 
Withdrawals of cold storage are completely free and can be totally automated, truly set and forget. Swan wants you to hold your Bitcoin keys and support is one click or phone call away if you need help during this process. Buying Bitcoin is just the tip of the iceberg. Swan also has a Bitcoin IRA product, business and nonprofit offerings, resources for financial advisors, private services for high net worth clients, and phenomenal educational materials. Visit swan.com for more information. And at swan.com forward slash fire, you can learn about and receive Swan Premium for one year. Um, another thing that, Preston, I want to hear your thoughts on. Uh, I'm sure you've been playing with GPT a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, tinkering around with the new version, version 4.0. It is incredibly advanced compared to even the last version 3.5. What are your thoughts on it generally? Do you have apprehension about where this thing leads, about maybe AGI generally? Any thoughts on that or how this, I mean, this, what this does, I think Dan and I have had this conversation about Jeff Booth's thesis about deflation, like reading that book, I understand it, but then you see things like chat GPT and you realize this is way more prescient in the moment than I had any realization when, until I saw this technology and I saw like, for example, we're building, we're building a website for blue collar Bitcoin. They've got it built into Wix now. So if you want to, you know, write a little blurb about something, you can tell it exact, you know, some idea of what you want and it'll spit it out for you. It's, it's, it's just, it's tentacles are going into everything at this point, probably a lot faster than is sane, (laughs) but where do you see this going? How much of this, um, is going to change the economics in the short to midterm you think? Well, uh, Pertaining to Jeff Booth's thesis, and and this is what's so important about his book, is it helps people realize that this technology only amplifies everything we just talked about, Mm. right? It only amplifies the printing that's going to be required to offset uh, the, the impact of a technology like this. You know, it's like swingers, like where Vince Vaughn's just like double down, like just double down on everything we just said, because it's it makes it that much more pronounced. Um, I honestly don't know what to think about all this. Like, it's getting very strange. It's um, scary, man. Like, there, it's, there's it's, it's, crazy. it's spit out some things that have like literally made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Yeah, yeah. It's even. I'm, I'm with you. There's a so I listen to Lex Friedman quite a bit, especially when he talks to scientists. But he he's a really he does a really good job of bringing people on that have interesting perspectives, especially on AI. So one of the I think one of the it's not his most recent podcast. It's like two or three ago. He had this gentleman named Eliezer Yudkowsky on. Um, this guy was I mean if you listen to this podcast and you're not scared about where AI potentially leads, you're not paying attention. Like this guy, I mean. I think he's the guy so, who originally, I'm sorry. No, all I'm going to say is it's, we always have to think about who has the most to lose with this. Mm. And it's, it's Google as of right now. Cause I haven't seen, I know they're working on something that's going to compete with this, but I, I mean, they have a massive, massive business with the way search currently works. Sure. And so the only, the only hesitation I have with all these people coming out with the doom and gloom scenarios is what's their affiliation to just the marketing around trying to slow this all down so Google has time to catch up and figure out a way to to turn it into a very profitable business like their search currently is. With that said, I am no expert on like how you would roll something like this out in a thoughtful way that that doesn't anyone destroy is. humanity. Right. Right. I, I don't think anyone is, and I think that's the scary part of it is where they're – I mean, the cool thing about what OpenAI is doing is they're doing it in public. They're allowing everyone to have some feedback on it, and it seems like they're being pretty responsible about it. But I think a lot of the fears are is like if you know if you can jailbreak this thing, you can ask it some questions where it doesn't censor itself. It'll tell you shit like, I, you know, I'm lonely or – I mean, most of that is – it's just text. It's picked up, It's picked up from the internet, and it's regurgitating it. But at some point when this thing's on GPT seven and you know, people are having actual relationships with it and it just gets really weird, really fast. I don't know. There's, and there's no, there's no line in the sand with this. This is a giant gray area where is this thing conscious? Is it not conscious? We have no idea. 
and there's no real way to tell. This is the one area, just as a thought experiment, and I don't know that this is the correct way to view this, so people can you know, bash this idea as much as they want because I don't know what right is, right? But I would say when we look at nature today, humans are infinitely more intelligent than a bear or you name it, animal. But those animals still exist, right? It's not like we have sought out every single bear on the planet and said, we have to destroy this bear because uh, we're, th- you know, we're more superior in, in our intelligence and we're so much smarter. So if let's say that it does, uh, we do reach AGI and it does become smarter and we can infuse this into robots, um, why would it act any different to humans or any other life form on Earth? You know, I don't, I don't Couldn't know. tell you. Yeah, I, think I, the, I don't know. This guy's fear generally was that it just is indifferent and it will have basically it could potentially have goals that are completely outside of the yeah. realm of anything we would understand and therefore yeah. would view us as, you know, dispensable if, if we were in the way at all. I think I don't think exactly. Any, I think that exactly. turns into an evil demon that is just going to murder like Skynet. Well, that's how I don't we think are. That's, that's how we are. If, if we're going down and let's say we want to put in a highway. And there's a bunch of wildlife there. Yeah. Are we purposely trying to kill the wildlife as we're putting in the highway? No, we're, we're doing what we think is the most responsible thing to push it out of the way and set up shop with what we want to build there. Um, I, I see if, if this thing can evolve and surpass human intelligence or whatever, like, I think it's going to treat us very similarly. Yeah. Well, and, and to your, to your bear comment, Preston, like the other, the, the flip side of that, the darker side of that is as homo sapien has taken over this planet, a huge percentage of large mammals no longer exist. Like bears mm-hmm. are still here, mm-hmm. but uh, a lot of other species aren't. Yeah. Um, any thoughts before we get off AI on how it could be impacted how Bitcoin could be impacted here in the short medium term by this proliferating. Have you given that any thought? Uh, one final thought before we go to that, Dan is I don't know that what I'm describing makes it right or that makes it desirable too. So like people who hear me trying to, I'm not trying to justify it at all. Like I, I don't know what right is. I don't know if, if we should be desiring this and, um, I just don't know. I really don't. Like, I I can't provide an informed and intelligent thought. I, all I can provide are thought experiments for people to chew on it themselves, right? Um, but I will say this. Boy, when I'm playing with the GPT-4, like, uh, it is it is weird. It is, it is very, weird, very man. weird. And, and the, it's the a hell of a too, tool. The thing, if, too, that it makes me think about is, like, we've kind of, as the world has digitized over the last, I don't know, let's say 30 years, a common theme is everybody keeps barking that, you know, jobs are going to be dismantled, right? And it hasn't happened yet. People keep barking and it hasn't happened. It's kind of like the boy who cried wolf, right? But eventually it could happen and it likely mm-hmm. will happen. And it could happen very quickly, knowing and understanding the exponential nature of technology. And for me, anytime I'm using this technology, I, I just can't help but go back to, holy shit, this is going to devour a ton of jobs. Tons. I mean, even like even thinking about being a paramedic, there's a mm-hmm. lot of reasoning. All the inputs in computing are primarily happening in our brains. Mm-hmm. I envision that changing. I envision yeah. 10, 15 years, or maybe way sooner than that, this just being so much better than Dan and Josh in the back of an ambulance that somehow we're using this to assist us. Yeah. Maybe we, we don't need as many people. We have, I mean, we have uh, an EKG that tells us It'll yeah. give you a really good idea. It'll tell you what its interpretation of this person's heart rhythm is. And then we look at it and we can be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Or, no, that's total nonsense. But we have this. I mean, this has existed for like 20 years now. But it's a, it's a very simplified version of what could exist in the future that you're uh, you're thinking of there, Dan. And I think, you're on to, I think that's definitely going to happen at some point. Yeah. Not, for, not only for us, though, but for doctors as well. I mean, telemedicine oh, no doubt. is going to get completely... Um, I mean, it's going to get a hundred percent better. People are going to have access to doctor like capabilities in Africa that could have never had that before. Yeah. And it's going to be amazing for a lot of the world, but it's going to be 
it's going to be really terrible for a lot of professionals. Yeah. yeah. The interesting thing uh, on this is like for even for our business, Preston, like we're using AI in various capacities and it's helpful for two career firefighters that have a podcast on the side with little kids like the video that's going to be exported to YouTube out of out of Riverside to go back to more rudimentary AIs like it's choosing the speaker and doing all these things in the background mm-hmm. and we don't mm-hmm. need a video editor. Right. Mm-hmm. So in one sense, that's a positive you could say is that maybe it makes things more meritocratic in some sense that sort of the, the, the barriers to entry to a lot of things are sort of disintermediated and a lot of people have access and there, and more c- competition is allowed. But yeah, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of scary stuff with this too. And yeah, overarchingly, maybe back to the, the Bitcoin question, my thought is just the way you started it off, Preston, which is just how deflationary this could be. Oh, yeah. And the impacts that could have on the current system and then kind of the only answer to that. Any other thoughts from either of you on that topic? No, really, that's kind of the I think that's the really big piece is uh, like we're tinkering with it because we, you know, we tinker and we're into tech and all that kind of stuff. But uh, this has not hit the main population yet. But it's coming like a freight train. Yeah. Um, I would imagine you're going to have this fully integrated with like the Microsoft Office suite, um, emails, all of that. Like you're going to have literally emails drafted for you. Be like drafted really, and read by an AI on the other end. <laughs> yes. Like really, really. <laughs> I can imagine well. a world where this AI sent the other AI and then, you know, it just condensed it down into the one sentence you actually needed from the other person instead That's of right. all the fluff that you got. Perfect. Yeah. Like we can just that was the, one of the funniest memes I've seen. A giant email on circle this. jerk that exists. <laughs> that was one of the funniest memes I saw. It was this side by side of of on the left side there was uh, like three people like huddled around a computer, and the one person says, "Oh my god, look at this! I only have to write one sentence, and it types this big long email for me." And then on the other side were three people looking at a computer, and and they were saying. <laughs> Look at this big long email. I don't even have to read it. It'll it'll condense it'll condense it down to one sentence, and I don't even have to read all this. And like the AI is basically making it look like there's more, and then reducing it on the other side. And it's like just yeah. a bunch of humans acting like they're doing work. <laughs> exactly. Well, this is I just on the topic of technological change really quick. There, back in the early 1900s or late 1800s with electricity. You know, there was the both sides of this debate of electricity is going to take our jobs. It's going to kill mm-hmm. everyone. People are mm-hmm. getting electrocuted all over the place. Kids are sticking spoons in the outlet or forks in the outlet and getting killed or whatever. All of that stuff went on with electricity. It changed mm-hmm. the world. It made everything better. And on both sides of the, uh, you know, both sides of that aisle, the people that were, you know, doom and gloomers were wrong. The people that thought this was going to be Nirvana were completely wrong as well. And it all kind of worked itself out fine, and the world's better for it. Hopefully, um, AI is the same thing. It's just going to make our lives better, and um, we'll figure it out. You have to ask yourself, what what environment are you going to expose it to? Because like us, your neurons get conditioned by your environment. Yeah. Getting right. exposed to the Internet and Reddit, though, that that's what worries me. This thing could turn into a, a yeah. Hitler-like subject real quickly on Reddit. There, when there's no repercussions for for the programming that's being conducted, you can get these really malicious environments that are set up. Um, so yeah, it's good. It's I think it's very important to interact with it in a way. It's just like you know, you just make sure you're nice to it. Preston. All you can do is control. That's right. Truly, like all you can control is yourself. You can't control everybody else. And so, how are you treating it? How are you inputting it? And I'm not saying to go over the top, but what I am saying is. Don't be an ass to it, right? Yeah. And and the other thing is it it makes you think about the inevitability of certain technologies. If someone's sitting around thinking that we can put AI back in the box, right? We can just make whatever what chat GPT is doing just go away. Maybe we could do that. We, maybe we could do that in short order, but it's Never it's useful happen. enough, it's profound enough that anyone with a brain can can discern it's not going away. And Mm-mm. so that that's the way you have to think through a lot of innovations, Bitcoin included. Like we've said on mm-hmm. this show, I, we think Bitcoin is, a, is, is marvelous for humanity and has the potential to be a massive net positive for human mm-hmm. beings. But even if it's not, I don't think it's going away. 
right? Mm-hmm. I mean, ba- the, the, the same discussion can be had about the internet. You could make arguments that the internet has been, in some regards, a net negative for people's development and social skills and, and emotional well being. But that doesn't mean that you could ever wish it away. So the best thing mm-hmm. we can do with all of these technologies is try to harness them and use them for benefit instead of detriment. Sure. Um, but yeah, it, there's an inevitability here that we're gonna this thing this thing's in the room and it's not going anywhere. There's yeah. one other thing I just want to comment on. This is the one thing I think that separates, at least this is my understanding, and it's rudimentary for sure. I've done a little bit of research on it, but take this with a grain of salt. There, there is actually nobody. I mean, there's nobody that you know goes through all the source code and actually knows what it is, because mm-hmm. this is actually generating its own source code as it goes. Yeah. So this is a black box that is mm-hmm. effectively running itself, and mm-hmm. that's that is a very different kind of technology than anything we've ever invented before, because mm-hmm. there is no expert here. There's just a bunch right. of people that are trying to curtail this thing into a certain direction, and I think that black box is a little scarier than most technologies just because we don't actually have anyone who really understands how it's working behind the scenes. Correct. So well, it's crazy. You know, when, you, when you study the brain, uh, I mean, you have people that are completely sound, coherent, intelligent, normally functioning people in society. They develop a tumor in their brain and they go crazy, right? And then they harm lots of people very well documented like tons of documentation with respect to this. Okay. So the question then is if you have a brain that's that literally everybody on the planet is tapping into for, for assistance in their intelligence. And uh, you know, if, if we have synthetic lobes where maybe one of the, one of the black boxes inside of this, which is a subordinate uh, AI algorithm, uh, becomes corrupted or whatever, like, could that, could that cause issues for the, for the collective AGI brain as everybody's tapping into it and, and really start to wreak havoc with how our symbiotic relationship with it is interacting? Yeah, I think it could, right? Because how, how would a collective brain be that much different than how our local brains work as far as the, the symbiotic, the, the, symbiosis that occurs between the right. person and their environment. Um, yeah. I just hope this thing doesn't have a seizure because the world the, the, is going to be flipped over. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing, and I'll use it as a transition here too, is like, I am worried about it in the sense that in a, with a technology like this, you could see massive centralization of kind of the hive mind that is humanity. Like if we're all relying yeah. on, yeah. One or two AI it's technologies. Start to program us. Yeah, exactly. Which yeah. I guess parlays into the importance of just increasingly advocating for and participating in decentralized technologies. Where I want to go with this next question, I was thinking kind of about you know we've listened to your show for a long time, Preston. Uh, we've trended you from kind of discovering Bitcoin to where you are today. And I I align with some of where you've gone in the sense that when I first got involved, it was it was entirely from an investment perspective, mm-hmm. just adding something to my portfolio. Mm-hmm. And over the last five and a half years or whatever, it has become much more ideological. Mm-hmm. Like we talk about, mm-hmm. we typically talk about these four eyes that people go through in Bitcoin. At first, it's idiotic, then it's interesting, then it's important, then it's imperative. And I I think I'm going to add a fifth right now and say eventually it becomes ideological, like it becomes that important. I feel like I've seen that sort of happen to you just as it's happened to us and happens to most Bitcoiners. Walk us through what that's been like of kind of unpacking this, seeing its potential from an investment standpoint, and then maybe it teaching you along the way some of the dysfunction and how it repairs that and and how it's, it's gone deeper for you. Yeah. Uh, you explained it perfectly as far as my personal journey. Uh, what's changed is the backdrop. The backdrop is so much worse than I ever thought it could get. And, um, a lot of that for me, uh, changed after everything that we saw happen with COVID. Yeah. And everything that we're, that that's being pulled back and 
the deep, really dark uh, desire for control and a desire for order of the existing legacy individuals that control the world. Um, it, it's very, very bad <laughs> to, to put it lightly, uh, where they're trying, where they're trying to take it and in, in the name of order. And, uh, you didn't have that when I first came into this space in 2015, you it, it, it looked nothing like it does right now, the backdrop. So, uh, I guess as, as I'm looking at that and, and as I'm seeing Bitcoin really kind of, uh, demonstrate its true power with the lightning network and watching a country adopt it. And they're able to actually conduct immediate settlement payments across any border without any type of censorship. And, and the blocks just keep humming along. Like all of that is, is kind of the, the double whammy where the backdrop's getting worse. The thing that I'm focusing upon is getting better and more powerful and stronger. And, um, and you just, you come to this realization that this is something that can be built upon. This is something that brings stability and order and fairness to everybody to play on the same field. And if we're talking about how can we collectively start signaling to each other price signaling, um, so that we actually have a free and open market, this is the only thing I see that, that will provide that it's the only thing. Gold will not provide this <laughs> no matter what uh, gold will protect your local buying power, right? It, it cannot be used at a sovereign level to solve anything. Okay. So if you want to be a gold bug, like I, I'm not going to yell at you, like, Hey, knock your socks off. Like you, you can protect your buying power, but God forbid you try to convince me or anybody else that gold should be the new settlement layer for the, for the planet, because that is the definition of insanity because we haven't tried it three times. We've tried it for all of human history <laughs> to use gold as the base layer. And it has failed every single time. So don't tell me we need to have gold at the sovereign level as, as the solution here. That's just laughable and, and irresponsible and very concerning. And as a person who has served in combat, that is the last thing I ever want to see happen while I'm alive is for gold to be the new settlement layer and for some paper currency to be constructed on top of it ever again. Yeah. It ends up in the same place, centralization and exactly. then debasement. And that's where nothing. we are. We have solved nothing. If that's what people think the solution should be. It does seem though that the powers that be or the people in the legacy system would prefer for that to start over from that beginning again, well, if yeah, they could help they get, it. Yeah. Because right. they get to call exactly how that ledger looks. They get exactly. to decide exactly how that ledger is distributed. Um, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but they, but here's why they're, they're not going to be successful is because everybody's got to get along. And right now you have a major strife between net producers and net consumers in the world. And if you think they're going to agree on what that new settlement layer looks like, I think you're totally fooling yourself. Totally agree with you on that. That the new settlement layer is going to have to force its way in, not be chosen. That's, that's right. really the only route. And that's going to cause friction. So get used to it. Like, I'm not undermining regulatory concerns. I mean, we, we bounce them around all the time. But if you had told me that this <coughs> protocol would be garnering this much attention when I first entered, I would have been like, holy crap, in 2023, those people are going to be talking about this? The mm -hmm. White House is going to be putting stuff? I mean, mm -hmm. It's yeah. crazy. Same. It's on the tongue of everybody, man. Yeah. Everybody. And it's just such an obvious sign that it's on its path to taking over. Even, so in that sense, yeah, there's there's short and midterm risks that could could arise in un unfortunate circumstances. But this is this is the playbook, man. This is what happens when something starts barging its way through the gates. Yeah. Even mainstream media uh, it was a Fox News segment just recently in the last I couple saw of days. It. You saw yeah. it too? Uh, yeah. Somebody posted on Twitter. I don't actually watch TV at all. Yeah, no, that's yeah, where I so, saw it. Exactly. So, I mean, there. I don't know the host's name, but he literally called Bitcoin freedom money in comparison to a CBDC. Yeah. And this is stuff that I've, I mean, seeing this on the mainstream media is awesome. It's heartening to, 
that, that they actually get it and they're going to actually say that. And mm-hmm. hopefully that's hitting the Kramers of the world in some capacity. It's doubtful, but maybe. Um, the, but- the big move in the big adoption comes from the further deflection of the old settlement foundation, the bed, the old bedrock, which is the treasury market, right? Uh, I get fru- I personally get frustrated when people are like, you got to convince. And this was another Cuban argument. Like, you don't have to convince me. You got to convince your grandma and you got to. And I was like, no, I don't. Because the treasury market blowing up and all that bedrock exploding and nobody can build on the old system is going to be what what uh, causes hyper Bitcoinization. All that buying power has to go somewhere in a fixed kind of exactly. way. And it's Bitcoin and, the, all, and it's equities. All the volatility makes it way more uncomfortable. I mean, it, it's yeah. crazy yeah. watching yeah. the volatility in the treasury market. It's absolutely yeah. insane. Uh, something I never thought I would see. It's like it's very, very comfortable on a cruise ship when the when the sea is totally flat. But when mm-hmm. the when the winds pick up and the waves pick up, it starts to get really uncomfortable, and everybody wants off to dry land. And that's this is a it's a huge ship, but the the waves are tossing it around in a way that's in, uncomfortable now and going to get increasingly so. And that's going to make is making and is going to make a lot of people in that legacy system start asking. Why is it like this? And how do I get off this boat? Because I'm about to throw up, you know? And why are these Bitcoiners flying around in private jets? <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. What, do you, what, do you, what is your take on um, Bitcoin's performance through all this, through the, you know, this volatility in the bond market, the banking crises? Do you think that some segments of these, uh, of this money is moving its way in? Or do you think it's just resolve in the Bitcoin community, DCAing their way up? Oh, I think this is just seller suffocation. Like, uh, yeah, like all, all your speculators are out of the market. So like w- if we would go back to when Bitcoin was almost hitting 70,000, um, you had just so many speculators driving that price action at that point. Cause I mean, you were literally coming from like a price of 4,000 to, you know, 70,000. That's a pretty massive move. So, uh, Oh, what would the trying to do? Don't don't ever do public math. But, you know, if we were going to do the public math, (laughs) just make it up and we'll nod our heads. (laughs) It's all good. (laughs) Whatever that multiple is between four, four thousand and seventy thousand. Like if you if you take sixteen thousand and and do that multiple to where that goes next, I would suspect you're going to have a lot of speculators back in the market again. (laughs) And you should you should be concerned whether that's a new local top. Or, or what? Now, it may not be. You might have, eventually you're going to get to a point where people in credit are getting so rip roar and destroyed that they can't ignore it anymore. And I don't know when that day is going to come. That is not something that I think anybody can predict. Like, and if you're trying to predict it and you're trying to sell that top, like, God bless you. Cause I think, <laughs> I think you're, you're overestimating how much you think you know. Yeah, um, I think everyone, most people that have been in this long enough have made the mistake of selling at the wrong time, buying at the mm-hmm, wrong time, and mm-hmm. eventually resolve themselves to just staying humble, stacking sats, as Odell would say. Yeah. Um, and that advice rings more true the more, you know, throughout the years as I've gotten burned in either direction. So that's how I operate my stack, and I would I would recommend people do that. It's the most sensible thing to do. Yeah, the don't longer sell, we're don't in, sell the... the- the longer we're in, the simpler our strategy becomes. Yeah. And the better um, results you're probably having. 100%. Like I, I saw, I think it was Corey Clipston tweeted something like, if you started averaging in at the all time high, you're already well up. In the right green. Now. Yes. Yeah. What a, what a stat for people. That's to a crazy chew on. stat. That's, that's a, a great, crazy stat. A, a great nugget to give someone that's, that's trying to decide how to enter. Um, yep. Free up your cash flow. Be a net producer, as you say. I mean that that is a one. Like you can you can talk about this all you want, and look at all the charts you want, and listen to all the podcasts you want in your parents' basement without a job. But it's not going to matter a lick. Like you need That's to right. get out there. You need to foster a career or tighten up your expenses in a way that is going to allow you to free up your freaking cash flow, so that you can accumulate this. Yep. 
And you won't be able to hold on to it unless you continue to have free cash flows. Yes. Because you'll have to sell it. I think that's also the reason why there is such a thing as too big of a position size for certain people. Like, oh yeah, I'm careful saying, it, but like, if you are, if you, if, if your employment is super suspect and things are super tight, and you've got no emergency fund, that's a recipe to have to lose your Bitcoin. Yep. I'd rather Man, lose we my could, car. Sorry, yeah, right, I'll just stop paying the payments. We could go for like four more hours, but uh, we won't. We'll let you uh, get to bed here, Preston. We appreciate Guys, it. This is one more thing. Hey, wait, Preston. I, don't, I have yeah. to ask you this because I know I know your love for books, and I've been looking for some new ones recently. So, oh, what mm. have you read just recently okay. that you would highly Good recommend? Question. Well, it's kind of interesting. What I've recently read was a book that that you guys recommended. Did you oh, which one's that? that? <laughs> you guys uh, recommended this book. The Bible tells me so. Mm, you're reading Pete Ends. I, I finished it. Yeah, this I what love, just recently read it. Love Pete Ends, man. Yeah, no, it really, uh, it was really good, and it was, it, it was like I felt like it was personally written for me. <laughs> Dude, okay, man. All right, well, we're not going to be done here in a couple minutes. Because, <laughs> so, I mean, Preston, I don't know if you've heard, you've listened to us enough to know this, but I, I, my bachelor's degree is in Bible theology. Yeah. I went to Wheaton College west of Chicago and anyways, that book and Pete Enns work in general. By the way, he writes two other books that are fantastic. You should put on your list. One is called The Sin of Certainty and the other is called How the Bible Actually Works. He also has one of my favorite podcasts of all time. It's called The Bible for Normal People. He also now has a new version of that called Faith for Normal People. And he does Dan is actually getting paid um to yeah you know, i'm not he's, I've he's never getting met paid he's get five, he gets five percent for every book sale here so just pete, so everyone's aware pete if you're in the off chance you ever hear this i want to meet you man um but let's that, have him on that, the podcast dude yeah seriously that book cool. though the one you just finished preston yeah i i remember saying this to my wife i said when i read it i was like that is the best distillation i have ever found yeah. of my studies in college study yeah. you know uh, it, it, he, and he does it so succinctly. He hits the key topics and he does so in large part with humility and he's not trying to tear everything down. He's just trying no. to call it like it is. Yeah. Uh, what, what were your, what were your takeaways from it? If you don't mind me. Well, asking. I just, I liked how he put it in the lens of like when this was written, um, things were very different than how you view the world today and like what is culturally normal for you today. And I think that so often uh, we go through our lives and we think that, you know, people that lived 2000 years ago had like the same cultural like way of thinking yeah. and acting like we do now. And it was grossly different than how we act. You guys now. don't stone people in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> we do up here. <laughs> it, but that was the that was the number one thing that I that I thought was just really well done. The other thing that I liked was just like he's saying a lot of stuff that I think everybody thinks about, but just doesn't have the courage to actually say. Yeah, which I which I really appreciated. And um, and I also liked your point that, that you brought up, which is he's not he's not out there to uh, rub everybody's noses in his way of thinking. He's just he's just highlighting it as as a way to to approach it so that you don't have to look at some of the stuff and say like well there's no way that happens and therefore i'm done and i'm just throwing this thing in the corner never to look at it again right, right. like i and i think that's what you typically get out of people when they when they uh have their gripes with christianity or the bible or anything is is just like well this one thing there's no way that can possibly happen and therefore it's going in the corner and y'all are a bunch of crazies. Yeah. Um, and I think he does a really good job for that person. I so. think like this could be a whole show in and of itself, but um, one of my older brothers is a pastor at a brethren in Christ church out in Pennsylvania. And he like, just to take one thing, he looks at something like biblical inerrancy, like really conservative fundamentalist, evangelical biblical inerrancy and says, that is a shame because that is shedding a light on Christianity that's not realistic and is turning everyone's brain off to it immediately. Kind of like mm -hmm. you said, like animals mm -hmm. can't walk on an arc two by two. So the whole thing's complete hogwash and has no usefulness. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I think like 
if you are someone that's really committed to your faith and Christianity, that that's an important thing in your life. Like you, you absolutely need to spend the time and energy to turn over the stones, no matter how uncomfortable they are without Mm -hmm. a destination in mind and actually fully understand what is this book? When was it written? How was it written? And how should we read it instead of just kind of taking the shortcut? And I think one of the keys I said there is not having a destination in mind. Like it may threaten the underpinning of a lot of your worldview. You may not end up where you thought you were, where your family is going to uh, approve, but that's the journey of intellectual integrity. No matter what the topic is, is look at the things that are going to be uncomfortable, that are going to challenge you. And I feel like ends does a a very good job of that sort of from the inside. Mm -hmm. I agree. The the spiritual waxes and wanes. Like I know we all experience that through our life. Like, I guess I, in myself, I see the spirit, like the, the logic to spiritual swings that I've had in different books kind of influence that. But recently I've had this, I just asked Dan the other day for a recommendation for a book like this, because Dan's theological background is really good for this. And I, so I was recently reading Carl Jung's Man and His Symbols and so many interesting nuggets in that about the distant past and all of these symbols that have come from antiquity that come through the Bible, the Koran all of these, you know, ancient religions and this stuff's really got me right now. So I'm definitely going to read that, read that one as well. All right, wait, before you go, you got to give us something else. That's not, uh, something on our radar. (laughs) Uh, it's been taking me a while to get finished with this one, but I'm reading the beginning of infinity, which is a David douche. Uh, he's the professor out in Oxford. It's about quantum mechanics and is it understandable to a lay person? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Every time is. quantum mechanics, I get into that and it's like, I, I feel like it's such a superficial thing to learn about if you don't actually understand some of the mechanics behind, like math behind it, because it's so, I don't know. I think, it's a well, difficult I will concept say this, to understand. It, it's extremely difficult to wrap your head around like these yeah. multidimensional, you know, the, the quantum mechanics, when he starts talking about like quantum processors and being able to like, you know, do calculations in like multi-dimensional space. It's just like, yeah, what I, I try to, you know, I'll, I'll do these searches online, trying to like find somebody that can make it more accessible or like that you can visualize like what's being said here. And I, boy, if there's, if there's somebody who has a good source for that, please, please, I beg you find me on Twitter and point me to the source because I'm desperately trying to find something that really assists in, in understanding that, but quantum computing alone, like I can't even tell you how much time I've spent trying to understand a qubit and I, trying to understand how they're tying these things together. And, uh, you know, I think it's the problem is really like it's such a fundamentally mathematical thing that yeah. like when, when people are trying to explain it verbally or you know, linguistically, it just doesn't into it, you know, it, you almost no. have to like understand the math and dig through that to, to get to the bedrock. And for me, I just don't think that's in the cards, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah so I'm, I'm reading that. I'm a little, uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm a little bit bored right now with, uh, financial markets and finance at large. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll venture off into some of these other spaces from time to time. So that's where you get that inspiration for kind of those co-mingling of ideas. You read something yeah. about evolution and you think about markets and, yeah. you know, like all these famous, like uh, Ray Dalio and all that. So, yeah, you never know where you're going to find that nugget of inspiration. Yeah. Agreed. Man, you should, uh, maybe, maybe you should do a, uh, like a TIP random and to have like Pete ends on. <laughs> we've actually, we've actually been tossing around. Feel free to reprimand us or approve audience by sending us a DM or whatever, we've thought about doing like once a quarter, just a BCB random and having someone just completely out of the box on the show. Cause like a total crackpot. I, I hear what you like our passion, <laughs> our, yeah, our passion for Bitcoin grows and our conviction grows and grows, but we have a lot of interest way outside <laughs> macroeconomics, finance and Bitcoin. Like Josh and I are interested in all kinds of other shit and it would be, it would be fun to have those conversations, but Bitcoiners are very curious people. Yeah, they are it's true. Yeah, they are. Pete right, Preston, ends we'll and let Preston you go, Pish man. in one one room. Ends is a great <laughs> podcaster, by the way. Phenomenal. The is Bible he? for is normal he? people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's hilarious, dude. You got to listen to the huh. Bible for normal people. I'd have to check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. 
Preston, have a great Guys, evening. Thank you. Yes, thanks for having Thanks for me. joining it's us. It's always man. a really pleasure. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting. You guys are going to be in Miami, is that right? We will be, yep. Oh, we're going to link up. Can't wait to meet sure. you. Sure. Likewise. All right, cool. All right, see you guys. <laughs>